Well, good evening. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Even though it's not Sabbath here yet. Um, but this is uh, study number 60 of the Three Angels' Messages of Righteousness by Faith. So this study here uh, we've been doing for quite a while. We're still studying A.T. Jones' 1895 General Conference Bulletin. And we're at number 19 in those presentations. And we're right in the thick of it. Uh, this is really where uh, he gets to the main point of the third angel's message of righteousness by faith, dealing with Christ. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful to be here that we can open your word together, that your Holy Spirit can unite us, and that we are privileged um, to be at this time in Earth's history and to be given the light that we are given. We're very, very grateful for these things. We know that many people are in darkness, that are, they are not aware that they're sinners, and they need your uh, light to shine upon them, and you've given us a responsibility to share that light with others. And we just pray, Lord, that those that we are coming into contact with each day, uh, that your character can be seen upon us, and that the words that we share will draw them to you. We pray for each person studying these things. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you can help us in our day-to-day -day trials and struggles. And we pray for the evangelistic efforts that we make um, in sharing these truths. So we ask now, Lord, as we open your word together, that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts, give us clear understanding, and that you can guide in this presentation. Be with us now, we pray. And uh, we also pray for a brother who's now in British Columbia that is trying to recover from addiction. We pray that your healing hand can be upon him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> now, someone asked me a question um, on uh, Facebook Messenger, and it's, it's a brother in Vietnam. He's doing presentations on uh, the three angels' messages. He's trying to present this, and he, he's trying to understand it. I mean, obviously, he has a language barrier in studying the material. Um, he, he does speak some English. and um, But he's trying to understand how the third angel's message is righteousness by faith. He, he doesn't really understand this. And um, we've, we've talked it about it before, that you have all three messages are combined to make up the everlasting gospel, that you can't have the third angel's message without the first and the second, and that all three messages are righteousness by faith. That is, these are the tests. This is light that comes to us, and our response to that light is, um, these are what these angels' messages are about. It's the everlasting gospel. And so this is the everlasting gospel worked out in a line. <coughs> Excuse me. And we know that, um, that every time we look at a line, we look at history, we're seeing an illustration of the gospel. We're seeing an illustration of righteousness by faith. When Ellen White says that righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity, we understand that, that, that it doesn't limit righteousness by faith to the third angel, but that all three messages embody righteousness by faith. But the third message is the one where it is demonstrated in the life. That is the one where, you know, Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in his people. Without that step of understanding unfolding in the person's life, Christ's character is not fully revealed. Now we know that once Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in his people, then shall he come to claim them as his own. And so the understanding of that, the intellectual understanding of righteousness by faith, 
is something that I have presented for years and years and years. So pretty much from the time that I was an Adventist, even before, that was my main interest of study, was righteousness by faith, what salvation is, how to overcome sin. And, and Adventism, one of the reasons I accepted Adventism is because it was the only church that actually really addressed that. Most churches that I knew, they were just concerned about getting saved. Well, getting saved just meant, you know, accepting Jesus Christ into your life, confessing with your lips, you know, the Lord Jesus, and, you know, you recognize yourself as a sinner, right? All those types of things. And then you're saved. And, of course, Jesus Christ came to save people from their sins, not just from the consequence of sin, but from sin itself, so that we could stop from sinning. And um, within Adventism, this truth has always been a fundamental truth. The problem is, is actually developing this experience. Now, this section here of the third angel's message, uh, number 19 and number 18 before that, and the ones that are following, this is where we see Jones really pulling this together about the nature of Christ. Now, the thing is, back in the 1980s and the 90s, uh, this was a hot issue in Adventism, the nature of Christ. Um, did Christ come in a, a nature of Adam before Adam fell? Did Christ come in the nature of Adam after Adam fell? And, and what ended up happening within Adventism was really much more um, uh, equivocation. It was, it was um, definitional arguments. People were redefining words so that they could come to an agreement. They weren't really trying to just accept what God's word said. So you could have people who accepted Jesus Christ came in a sinful human nature, but not actually even understand what that meant or what what or didn't draw the same conclusions. Because like Parminder, they would just say, well, he, he came in a sinful body. But but he didn't have any propensity to sin, which is true. He did not. But also Ellen White says we need not retain one sinful propensity. So when we do that, when we get rid of our sinful propensities we don't get a new nature we don't get like a new body we don't get rid of the fallen human nature what we get is a mind of christ and the mind of christ when we're dealing with that propensity that has to do with the mind not so much the body and then, so there's all these little arguments that are being made you know um uh so you know you talk about propensity or propensity or sinful tendencies and and Parminder, in his approach, he tried to slice through all that by just disconnecting our physical body from our spiritual body. And so, so he did, we didn't need to get a sinless human nature to stop from sinning. We just, we just had some kind of new nature that was our spiritual body. So this, this type of, which I would call a type of um, Greek dualism, is really what Parminder was presenting. But here, we understand that the person is a complete whole person. That there isn't, even though we have a sinful nature, that nature makes, us, makes, makes up us. But we have another thing called a character. And a character, for a character to be perfected, it has to do with the mind, the thoughts, and the feelings. Those, that is, the thoughts, the mind, controls the feelings. Whatever those feelings are, whether they come from where they come from, because feelings are, we would say, they're physical things. So, so Jones does a presentation that is very, very clear, but we don't understand it anymore. Because we have redefined all of the words of the English language so that when we read something that's plain, it, it's just confusion to us. And, and this is what I found happened in the 80s and 90s, is that it was all of these semantics that were going on without people just facing the reality of what God is saying in his word. So... 
So when we read through that, just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. <clears throat> we are to begin the comparison of Hebrews 2, verse 14 and 15 with Romans 6, verse 11 to 14. And of course, Hebrews 2, we know what that is, and we should know Romans 6, 11 to 14 as well. For, read first in Hebrews. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now we could just read this over really, you know, just on the surface and not really understand what's being talked about this. Now, Jones is going to parse this out for us. But just before we look at Jones' explanations, one of the things we see here, um, that when Christ took on flesh and blood, he took upon himself a nature that was subject to death. Because in order to defeat death, he has to die. And, and now, in defeating death, this is the power of death, that is the devil, right? right? So the devil has one that brought death. And we also have this fear of death. And, and the reason why we have a fear of death is because we are sinners. So without Christ dying for us, if we died, that would be the end of us, right? And so, so this is why Jesus took upon himself our nature. Okay. And, and Joan says that is what Christ did to deliver us. Now read in Romans 6. Uh, verse 11 to 14. So, likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So, <clears throat> so we can see here that, um, that we have some of these same words or same ideas. We have this idea of death, we have um, this idea of bondage. All of these different concepts are being presented here in, in this, um, these verses. So you can see why he's going to compare them. Okay. <clears throat> Just as he also himself likewise did that to deliver us, so we also ourselves likewise are to yield in order to be delivered. And when we do so, we are delivered. So he's saying here, we have what Christ did as an example. He yielded to his father. And we also are to yield. That is, we have to die as well. So for many Christians, you know, Christ died for me. That's it, right? But if we don't die... Christ's death does not benefit us. Correct? Because if we're alive, Christ's death didn't do anything for us. We have our cross as well. But his cross is necessary for us to have a cross. Because if we just died without Christ we're not going to live again. So that means we have to die in Christ so that we can be resurrected in Christ. So let's go back to what Jones is saying again. Just as he also himself likewise did that to deliver us, so we also ourselves likewise are to yield in order to be delivered. And when we do so, we are delivered. He did that in order to deliver us who all our lifetime were subject to bondage. We do that 
and then we are free from the bondage. And sin has no more dominion over us. Thus, Romans 6, 11 to 14 is the response of faith in the individual to Christ's action as in Hebrews 2, verse 14 and 15. So this is the part that tends to be missing. We look at what Christ has done for us, but if we don't have this response of faith, then what Christ did for us has no benefit. And this is why Jack Sekira in the 1888 Message Study Committee, when he just tried to say that everybody is just justified, Jesus died and he justified all men, well, that's not what the Bible teaches. But the Lord did more for him than to raise him from the dead. And he has done more for us in him than to raise us from the dead. He died. He was raised from the dead. We died with him. And what then? Did we rise with him? Have we a resurrection with him? Have we life from the dead in him? We are crucified with him. We died with him. We are buried with him. And he was raised from the dead than what of us. We are risen with him. But God did more for him than to raise him from the dead. God did more with him than to raise him from the dead. He raised him and also seated him at his own right hand in heaven. What of us? Do we stop short? No, sir. Are we not in him? as we are in him while he was alive on earth, as we are in him on the cross, as we are in him in death, as we are in him in the resurrection, so are we in him in the ascension, and we are in him at the right hand of God. Now this reminds me of a scripture um, that I think you know would be relevant here at um, this point. just don't remember where it is. I know what the scripture says, but let's find it here. Okay, so this is in... Um, in Matthew 20... Um, so it's Matthew twenty twenty. So let's let's just go here. Get rid of all the Greek numbers there. And then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he said unto her, What wilt thou? And she said unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, Ye know not what ye ask. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they say unto him, We are able. And he saith unto them, Ye shall indeed or ye shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared of my father. Now, so when we think about this, this definitely brings us to Romans chapter 6, right? Because Romans chapter 6 addresses this whole issue of baptism. Know ye not that as so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in new, newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, when my brother Peter got baptized... Um, back in was in the like 84 I don't know what year it would have been that would have been like 80 anyway 87 86 anyway I, I wrote this as a scripture song and every time there's a baptism I, I, I sing this 
Um, I don't know if I'm going to sing it tomorrow because I know my granddaughter's getting baptized tomorrow, but uh, I'm going to bring my guitar just in case. But anyway, this scripture here is definitely related to the ideas that Jones is discussing here. So let's go back to Jones. Okay, Romans 14, 7 and 9, Angela directs us to here. Um, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Okay. That would follow anyway from what we read last night. But let us read this itself in the scriptures and see that it is certainly so. As we have followed God's working in him so far, shall we follow it all the way? Last night and in the lessons before, we were glad to go with him through temptation and gain the victory. We were glad last night with him to go to the cross and find ourselves crucified there so that we could say in genuine faith, I am crucified with Christ. And we were glad to go into the grave with him, into death with him, so that it can be a genuine reckoning of faith to reckon ourselves also to be dead indeed. And we are glad of all of it. Let us also, let us be glad also to come forth from death with him in order that we may live a new life as he. And when we have come forth with him from the dead, for if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Let us rise with him as he is risen, not only from the dead, but to where he is. If God says so, if he proposes to carry us there and to carry the subject that far, Shall we go? Assuredly, yes. Let us not think strange of it if he should. Let us follow with him there just as freely as we followed with him against temptation and to the cross and into death. Therefore, take the second chapter of Ephesians, beginning with the fourth verse. God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, made us alive together with Christ. Quicken is to make alive, make us alive together with Christ, as Joan says, and hath raised us up together, together with whom? Christ. And made us sit together with whom? Christ. Where? Made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The word places is supplied there in our version. It is also supplied in Ephesians 1.2 and 120. In the Greek, it is eparaneus, and in the verbal translation, it is re- rendered the heavenlies. Uh, God has given us life together with him. God has raised us up together and made us sit together with him wherever he sits. Where then does he sit? He was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of the majesty on high. Hebrews 1 verse 3. God hath raised us up together, and he made us sit together with him where he sits. Now, the German makes it plainer than our authorized version, and plainer than this translation of the Greek even. Now, I'm not going to read the German, but um, because I don't read German. I mean, I could pronounce it. It wouldn't mean anything. uh, That the word saint means along with. um, So... And that is in the Greek word, literally, the Greek word means along with, together, and at the same time. And so the German words give it, right? So haton or whatever it is. Uh, gemacht, I know that. I know a little bit of Dutch. So gemacht means made. Um, uh, und hat uns sant him afterwerket. So a lot, that means uh, to wake up, right? So along with him, waked up but simply wake up like a man that is asleep and gets his eyes open, but still lies there, but waked up in such a way that he gets up so that we with him are given life from the dead. And he has waked us up in such a way that we get up and rise with him. So I've drawn out the definition of that word, Vesen, 
in full there, and it signifies essence, existence, being, manner of being, nature, character, disposition, air, demeanor, conduct, means of existence, property, estate, economy, existing arrangement, system, concern, right? All those different words. So he has made us sit with Christ in heaven, in the heavenly existence, in the heavenly essence, made us sit together with him in the heavenly being, in the heavenly manner of being, in the heavenly nature, in the heavenly character, in the heavenly disposition, in the heavenly air, in the heavenly demeanor, in the heavenly conduct. He has made us sit together with him in the heavenly means of existence, for our, our life is hid with Christ in God. Our means of existence is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. The heavenly means of existence, heavenly property, property estate, economy, existing arrangement, the existing order of things. We belong to heaven to the heavenly system altogether. Now, of course, we know he talked about this ambassadorship that we have. We can see that our kingdom, our country, is not an earthly country. It's in heavenly. And that's because in Christ, we are in heaven. Only in Christ can we be his ambassadors. Someone who's not in Christ cannot be Christ's ambassador. Because if you're not in Christ, you're not of heaven. It's only in Christ that that's the case. And that is where God has put us in Christ. So then, as we along with him in the heavenly existence, essence, air, disposition, etc., are made to sit in Christ Jesus, and shall we sit there in him? In other words, shall we rise? What is the word? Arise, shine. Arise first and then shine. We cannot shine until we rise. But what will this truth do for us? Will it not raise us? How high? Do you not see that it takes us out of this world and puts us along with Jesus Christ in the heavenly kingdom? Now, when I read this back, you know, in my early 20s, um, it was very, very helpful for me. The practical aspect was I wanted to look at things from the perspective of heaven. That is from this eternal perspective from God's perspective. So whatever situation I was in that seemed overwhelming, I would stand back and try to look at it from from heaven, so to speak. Right? Obviously, I'm not literally in heaven, but I could take myself there and say, how does God see this situation? How can I look at what's happening to me and what I'm experiencing? And in a sense, you know, distance yourself from that immediate reality that so many people are caught up in, whatever is bothering them, whatever their concern or worry is, that we, the one thing it did for me is it allowed me to see things from God's perspective. And, and, and God's perspective in a moral sense, you know, what is my responsibility here? Well, how am I supposed to act and behave if, you know, in this situation, because we have our nature, how the nature wants to act. Um, but that's that's being here on earth, earthy, right? But, you know, we are connected with the Lord from heaven. And so if we're in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, we need to see things from that expect perspective. So for me, it was personally very help, helpful as a young man to do that. I'm not saying I always did it, but I'm saying... It, it definitely helped in many situations that would have uh, dragged me down. So he says, will it not raise us? And that's what I experienced. Now, how high do you not see that it takes us out of this world and puts us along with Jesus Christ in the heavenly kingdom? It is, is it not plain that, that Jesus Christ has brought heaven to earth to him who believes? Therefore, it is written, he hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, when we think about this word translated, I mean, we know we talk about when we're going to be translated and we have people like Enoch and Elijah, they've been, were translated without seeing death, right? But, but we are in Christ already translated because Christ, he has died and he was alive, and then he was translated. And so we can be translated, transported 
into the kingdom of his dear son. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto this so-and-so. The kingdom of heaven is like unto so-and-so. The kingdom of heaven is like unto so-and-so. And the kingdom of heaven is nigh at hand. Well, what is that kingdom of heaven? He translates, translates us into it, has translated us into it. Shall we reside there and enjoy his blessed atmosphere and enjoy the disposition, the air, all the system and manner of existence that belong there and belong to us there? Now, we cannot raise ourselves even to this height. We are to submit to the truth and it will raise us. Look at it again in the first chapter of Ephesians, beginning in the 15th verse. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And this is the prayer that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. To how many, to whom, for how many is this prayer written? Will you take the prayer then yourself this evening and accept the thing that is prayed for on your behalf? Whose word is it anyway? Is it merely the prayer of a man? Is it not the word of God? Then is not the word of Jesus Christ by his spirit expressing his will and his wish concerning us as to what we shall have? Let us accept it then. It is his will. Read on. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may not know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe. He wants us to know what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. And the Greek word there is the word from which comes our word dynamite. Right, so that word power, dynamos. The exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly existence in heaven. The German is seated at his right in heaven. Now that power... <clears throat> of God raised up Jesus Christ and set him at his right in heaven. And every soul of us will say that, but he wants you and me to know the working of that power in ourselves, which raised up Christ and seated him there. When we know the working of that power in us that raised up Christ and seated him there, what will it do for us? It will raise us up and seat us there. Now, so when we talk about this, these types of ideas, um, that what often goes in a person's mind, because what we're trained to do, is to sort of um, pretend, right? You know, we we can imagine in our mind that we're we're up there in heaven with Christ, and we can imagine all these things. Um, you know, a lot of Christianity is just pretending, like not true Christianity. But but people pretend but it doesn't actually happen in their life. That is, just imagining yourself being in heaven isn't going to put you there. And part of this is that we have to obey Christ. Now, this, this becomes a problem because um, we don't have the power to do good in and of ourselves. And, and so you can't just get raised up we know that something has to happen, and, and, and Jones has laid that out. We have to die, right, in Christ. First Christ is going to come, and he's going to do this. And all of those things that he did in us, we can't just pretend that, that we, we have experienced this. We actually have to experience it. That is, we have to experience all of the agony that Christ experienced. Now, that is, we have to drink of the cup that he drank of and be baptized with the baptism that he was baptized with. That is, we have to take up our cross daily and follow Christ. So some people like to imagine that they're good, that they're righteous, that they're sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and they will 
say all kinds of prayers and, and have all kinds of attitudes um, in their own mind, but be completely unchristlike in their character. So we can't delude ourselves. We know what Christ has done, and we need to believe it. But in believing, you know, faith without works is dead. That is, there is a reality that we have to recognize that this is a cross. Because even though Christ has done it, we still have to experience it. It's just that in experiencing it, we are connected to Christ. And so we, we can go through this experience. It doesn't mean it's easy. So many Christians look for this easy experience. right? So they can go to church, they can say some prayers, they can do devotions, they can put up all kinds of Christian sayings in their house, um, they can dress and talk you know, like a Christian, and they can talk like a Christian, and they can do their devotions, read their Bible. But if there's a cross, every time that cross crosses them, and they shun that cross, that is, they complain, they, they don't take up that cross, they don't do that thing that God is telling them to do. It's all just a form of godliness, but denying the power of God. So, so some people can read this and, and, and think that they're doing this, but it, their whole life is telling them that they're not, because they're still trying to look at this as an easy way out. And, and, and the gospel is not an easy way out. It is the way of the cross. It's only possible because of Christ. Without Christ, we would never be able to face that cross. So Jones goes on. The second chapter of Colossians tells us the same story, beginning with the 12th verse. Buried with him in baptism, wherein ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, made alive, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Then everyone that is risen to seek the things that are above, whereabouts above, how high above, as high above as the place where Christ sits. But how can I seek the things where Christ sits unless I am near enough there to look around and seek those things and put my mind upon them? It is all in that. And when ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Shall we take that precisely as the Lord gives it without any query? I know it is wonderful. I know that it is a good many to a good many. It seems too good to be true, but there's nothing God does that is too good to be true because God does it. And if it were said of anybody else, it would be too good to be true because they could not do it. But when God says anything, it is not too good to be true. It is good enough to be true because he does it. Therefore, brethren, let us rise. And that will separate us from the world. That will put us in a place where long ago the prophet was told to look a little higher, to see those who were in the right way. But oh, shall we not drop everything and die with him and take the death that we have in him and let that death that has been wrought in him work in us? And then that life which has been wrought in him, that power which has been wrought in him, will do for us what it did for him. That will take us out of Babylon. There will be none of Babylon's material about us at all. We will be so far from Babylon and all the Babylonish garments that we will be seated at the right hand of God, clothed in heavenly apparel. And that is the only clothing that becomes the people now. For we are soon to enter into the wedding supper, and the fine linen with which the bride and guests are clothed is the righteousness of the saints. But he supplies it all. We have it all in him. Let us look at this in another way. 
I'm not particular to get away from this thought tonight, and it is good enough to dwell upon all the time we shall have this evening. Let us look at it from another side now. We have studied for several lessons the fact that he, in human nature, was ourselves. And he in us, and we in him, met temptation and the power of Satan and conquered it all in this world because God was with him. God was dealing with him. God was holding him and keeping him. He surrendered all and kept, and God kept him. In him we surrender all and God keeps us. And the Lord's dealing with dealings with him are the Lord's dealings with us. And that led to crucifixion. That is true. The crucifixion of his righteous divine self. And in that, he leads us to the crucifixion of our evil self, which separates from God. In him is destroyed the enmity. So God went with him and went with him in human nature all the way through this world. But God did not get done with his human nature in this world. The father was not done dealing with Christ in his human nature, nor done dealing with human nature in Christ when the son had been nailed to the cross. He had something more to do with human nature than to take it only to the cross. He took it even unto death. But he did not stop there with human nature. He took it to the cross and into death. But he did not stop there. He did not leave it there. He brought forth human nature from the tomb, immortalized. He did all this, but was not yet, but he was not yet done with human nature. For he took that human nature, which had been raised from the dead, immortalized, and he raised it up and set it at his own right hand, glorified with the fullness of the brightness of the glory of God in heaven itself. So that God's mind concerning human nature, concerning you and me, is never met, never fulfilled, until he finds us at his own right hand, glorified. Now, <clears throat> So Jones keeps repeating this idea. There's this process in which what Christ has done for us can and will become a re reality in human nature. Not for every human, because even though Christ died for all, not all are going to accept the cross. Not everyone is going to accept what Christ has done for them. Now, some people think, Accepting what Christ has done for you is simply just saying, I accept what Christ did for me, and I don't have to participate in what he did for me. He did it all for me. That's what some people think. But that's not what it means to accept what Christ has done for you. Because he has done it for you. He has paved the way that you can then sit at God's right hand. Right? We can be glorified in human nature. And if and if he just did it all for us and we didn't have anything to do with it, then everybody should be sitting at God's right hand glorified in the end. Right? That's where you get universalism. This idea that well Christ did this, he died for all men, and all men are justified, so all men must be saved, and all men must then um, be resurrected in Christ, and all men must then be glorified. And so Everybody must be. So you can't start down the path one way. You can't just say, well, Christ died for all men, but he didn't do all the other things for all men. Right? Because he did it for all men all the way through from the beginning to the end. Right? So, so you can see that there has to be this response to what Christ has done. Otherwise, there'd be no point of even preaching about it. Because if Christ just died for all men, then all men are saved. You know, if, if you apply it in that way, if that definition of dying for all men, all men are then justified, all men are then sanctified, all men are then glorified. And why even have the preaching of it? Why even have history unfolding the way that it does? So we know that this actually has to be worked out in the life. And the knowledge of it in itself is not sufficient. We need to know about these things, but those in it, things in and of themselves are not going to make us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. 
for James and John uh, to sit on the right hand or the left hand, right? They have to be, they have to drink of that cup that Christ drank of, and they have to be baptized with that baptism that Christ was baptized with. We have to experience the gospel. <clears throat> there is a revivifying power in that blessed truth. And of course there is. Knowing these things is very, very helpful. It, it does bring life to us because it is truth. In Jesus Christ, the Father has set before the universe the thought of his mind concerning mankind. Oh, how much, how far a man misses every purpose, every idea of his existence, who is content with anything less than that which God has prepared for him. Brethren, do you not see that we have been content to stay too low down, that we have been content to have our minds too far from what God has for us? That is a fact. But now, as he comes and calls us into this, let us go where he will lead us. It is faith that does it. It is not presumption. It is the only right thing to do. Everyone that does not do it will be left so far behind that he will perish in a little while. Here the heavenly shepherd is leading us. He is leading us into green pastures and by the still waters. And by those still waters too that flow from the throne of God, the waters of life itself. Let us drink deep and live. Now, um... The thought um, that I had, um, I'm trying to sort of frame this thought. Hmm. So this idea, so uh, we've been reading five testimonies. And Ellen White is constantly talking about the worldliness of the church, the people are satisfied with the things of this earth. Those are the things that occupy their attention, making money, especially when, when it talks, she's talking about the pastoral ministry, the ministers who are so ineffectual because all they think about is how much money they can make and, and everything that they do is about self. And so when Joan says here, um, um, where is it? We have been content to stay too low down. That is, we're content with this world. We think about the comforts of this world. Uh, we think about the, you know, the things of this world. And those are the things that occupy our attention that, that we're satisfied with. So, and if that's the case, if we're satisfied with the world, then we have no, no desire for the things of heaven. And so this water that flows from the throne of God, this is the water of life. We are not interested in life because life is a difficult thing. Life is not an easy thing. In order for us even to live in this, this world, we have to work, we have to labor, we have to take our energies to just exist. The wolf is always at the door. But the same applies to God's heavenly kingdom. That life, we have to put our energies in that direction. The things that we do the things that we talk about show where our heart is now we can look at that yet further i will say again that the lord in order to show mankind that he has prepared for us what he has prepared for us what his purpose is concerning each man has set before us an example so that everyone in the world can see god's purpose concerning himself and can see it fully worked out God's purpose concerning us in this world is to keep us from sinning in spite of all the power of sin and Satan. His purpose concerning himself and us in this world 
is that God shall be manifested in sinful flesh. That is, in his power, he himself shall be manifested instead of ourselves. It is therefore that our wicked self shall be crucified, shall be dead and buried, and that we shall be raised from the deadness in sin and uncircumcision of the flesh to newness of life in Jesus Christ and in God and seated at his right hand, glorified. That is the Lord's purpose concerning you and me. And that's not what most people want, right? They want Christ to do it, but it not be manifested in our life. So now let us read it, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. How do we know it? He not only says so, but he has worked it out before our eyes. He has given a living demonstration of it. So he carries us right through that now. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. What purpose? Why his eternal purpose concerning all creatures, concerning man with the rest, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That purpose from eternity is proposed in Jesus Christ. And when we are in Jesus Christ, that purpose embraces us. When we yield to Christ, sinking ourselves in him, we become part of that eternal purpose. And then just as certainly as God's purpose is to succeed, we shall be all right, for we are part of his purpose. Then just as certainly as Satan can do nothing against God's purpose, so certainly he can do nothing against us, for we are in that purpose. Now, another thing I learned from Jones when I read this as a young man, is I understood, and, and for me this was an important um, uh, practical lesson. One is, you know, we talked about seeing things from God's perspective, but also from his purpose. Um, there's a book by Lewis F. Weir called The Moral Purpose of Prophecy. And that's why prophecy is important because it illustrates God's purpose. All of these things that we draw out on these lines in our morning studies, book of Judges and everything like that, these are all showing God's purpose. And God's purpose is that men are in darkness and God wants to bring light to them because he wants to lead them to his eternal purpose, to his kingdom. And if we know that all of the purposes are God's purposes, if we make our purposes the same purpose that God has for us, then Satan can do nothing against us. Right? And, and so often people focus upon all of the bad things that are happening. They talk about what Satan's doing. But if we are in Christ, we should have no fear about what Satan is doing. We, that is, nothing can come to me that hasn't first gone through Christ. And so nothing bad can happen to me. Because if all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose, even the bad things that happen to me are good if I am in Christ. Because God has allowed those things to teach me for his work to be accomplished in me and his work to be manifest in me to the world. So every bad thing that happens, I don't even consider that it comes from Satan, even though I know it does. Because I know even though it comes from Satan, it goes through God first. So I can trust that God's purposes are being worked out. So I can't truly be discouraged if I'm part of God's purpose. I may at times not see that purpose and wonder what's occurring, but I can trust that God knows what's occurring and that he has his purpose 
in what is occurring. Then just as certainly as Satan can do nothing against God's purpose, so certainly he can do nothing against us, for we are in that purpose. So can't you see that we have no fear of Satan if we are in God's purpose? Satan can do nothing against us. So when we say that Satan has done something against us, what are we saying? What are we really saying when we say Satan is doing this in my life? What are we really saying? That we are like promoting God's purpose. Yeah, that I'm not connected to God's purpose, right? I'm saying that Satan has more power than God. Right? That is a lack of faith to say that Satan is doing this or that in my life. Because Satan can do nothing against God's purpose. He can do nothing against us. Just as certainly then, as all that Satan does and all that the enemies of God's truth can do, working against God and his divine purpose, and at last all these things against us, so certainly as all this cannot defeat or cripple that eternal purpose, so certainly it cannot defeat or cripple us, because in Christ we are a fixture in that purpose. Oh, it is all in him, and God has created us anew in him. Now, I want to share to you some personal experience. It's it's not the easiest thing to share. Um, but when I was a kid, I was scared of the dark. Maybe some of you have been scared of the dark. Now, I remember specifically when I became scared of the dark. I became scared of the dark when I willfully sinned as a child. Now, I remember being about three years old and and eating mandarin oranges underneath my parents' bed. And and I wasn't really sinning. I was just a child. I didn't even feel guilty. I didn't want them to know that I was eating the mandarin oranges, you know, those wooden crates of Japanese mandarin oranges. Um, but when I was a few years older, I um, stole something, and I knew it was wrong. And um, the guilt that came with that caused me to be scared of the dark. Because now I was scared of something. I had the fear of death. I was now, in my mind, I understood that I was, I'd done something wrong. I wasn't aware of a sinner and a savior or anything, but I knew that I had done something wrong. And, and I was scared of the dark until I was 40 years old. When I was 40 years old, that's, around the type time that my life began to unravel after being a Christian and everything began to unravel. And I prayed to God to destroy my life, and he did destroy my life, and I had to rebuild it in Christ once again. I had to go through a reconversion. And that's, why, that's when God led me to this movement. Um, and, um, but, th but the thing that was interesting is at that time when I was 40, I was really aware that for the first time I wasn't scared of the dark. Now, it's kind of silly for you know somebody in their 30s or 20s even to be scared of the dark, but I was always scared of the dark until I was 40. So God did something in me uh, when I was 40 that allowed me not to be scared of the dark, not to be scared of Satan, right? To be scared of what Satan could do. So even though I experienced it in some ways earlier in my life, to not be scared of the dark to me has always been a miracle, that I'm no longer scared of the dark. But that's something that Christ does in us because we can realize that Satan can do nothing against it. Nothing, even the dark, even the deepest darkness of lies and error can do nothing against us. And that I can trust in Christ that his purposes are worked out. No matter what those are, what's going to happen to me, I can know that God's purposes are being worked out. 
So Joan says, read on then. God tells us how we know that all things work together for good to those who are called according to God's purpose. For, what does that mean? Like in for good. It means the same thing as because. That is, we know this because God has done something here to demonstrate it so that we can know it. What is this then by which we know it? So we can say, for all things work together for good because God, um, together because good uh, is being done, right? So that's what he's trying to say. What is it then by which we know it? We know it because whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. What is God's predestination then? What is the design that he has fixed beforehand, that he has prepared beforehand for every man in the world? For he has foreknown all, he has called all, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. What is the destiny that he has prepared beforehand for everyone? Oh, is it that we should be conformed to the image of his son? Where? While we are in this world, conformed to the image of his son, as his son was in this world. But he did not get done with his son in this world. He took him from this world. Then, as certainly as his purpose, his eternal purpose, carried Christ beyond this world, that predestinate, predestined purpose is concerning us beyond this world and carries us beyond this world. And as certainly as his predestined purpose is that we shall be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ in this world as he was in this world. So certain it is that we shall be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ in that other world as he is in that other world. God's eternal purpose prepared beforehand for every one of us, for you, for me, is that we shall be like Jesus Christ as he is glorified and at the right hand of God tonight. In Christ, he has demonstrated this. In Christ, from birth to the heavenly throne, he has shown that that is his purpose concerning every man. Thus he has demonstrated before the universe that such is his great purpose for human beings. God's ideal of a man is not as man stands in this world. Take the finest figure of a man who ever stood in this world, the tallest, the most symmetrical, the best educated, the finest in every respect, the fullest, completest man in himself. Is that God's ideal of man? No. You remember that we found back in one of our lessons that God's ideal of a man is God and the man joined in that new man that is made in Christ Jesus by the destruction of the enmity. That new man that is made of the union of God and man is God's ideal man. But yet, take that man as he stands in this world, in the perfect sy symmetry of human perfection, and unite God with him so that only God is manifested in him. That is not yet God's full ideal of a man, for that man is still in this world. The ideal of God concerning that man is never met until that man stands at God's right hand in heaven glorified. Oh, he has prepared great things for us, and I propose to enjoy them. Yes, sir, I propose to open up and let the wondrous power work, and I enjoy it as I go. Read on, therefore, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Oh, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He that sanctifieth and they that are sanctified are all of one. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, those in whom that call meets its purpose and in whom the call is effective, he calls every soul, that is true, on his part. But the call does not meet its purpose. Only those who respond and meet the purpose of that call, in whom the call takes hold, them he also justified. So this this statement here undoes everything that Jack Sakira has claimed that Jones and Wagner were teaching. So, right? So um, Jack Sakira would say, well, God predestinated us. He called us. 
and he justifies us, right? But Joan says, no, he can't justify you if we don't respond to meet the purpose of that call. And then he says, and whom he justified. Mark, not only those who justify themselves, don't, um, not those who justify themselves, those whom he justified, them he also glorified. Then do you not see that God's purpose concerning man is not fulfilled until man is glorified? Therefore, Jesus came into the world as we do. He took our human nature as we do by birth. And he went through this world in human nature, God dealing with human nature. He went to the cross and died, God dealing with human nature on the cross and in the grave, and God raising him and setting him at the right hand of God, glorified. That is his eternal purpose. That is God's eternal predestination. That is the plan he has arranged and fixed for you. Will you let him carry out the plan? We cannot do it. He must. But he has shown his ability to do it. He has proven that. Nobody can dispute that. He has proven his ability to take us and fulfill his purpose concerning, concerning human nature, concerning sinful flesh as it is in this world. And I am glad of it. But you see here, whom he called, and he also justified, and whom he justified, what did he do next? He glorified them. Now a question. Those whom he justifies, he glorifies. He cannot glorify them until he has justified them. What means then this special message of justification that God has been sending these years to the church and to the world? It means that God is preparing to glorify his people. But we are glorified only at the coming of the Lord. Therefore, this special message of justification which God has been sending us to prepare us for glorification at the coming of the Lord, in this, God is giving to us the strongest sign that it is possible for him to give, that the next thing is the coming of the Lord. Now, you can see that the church does not like this message that Jones is stating here. Because this idea that there's this special message of justification, the church would just say the justification that was talked about by uh, Martin Luther, that's the message of justification. But we know that there's a special message of justification. The message, the third angel's message, is the message about what God is going to accomplish in the final generation at the Sunday law test, because we know the third angel's message is about the Sunday law, right? That's the third angel, the Sunday law. And, and God is going to demonstrate from the Sunday law to the second coming, through all those events, the final events of this earth's history, that what Jesus accomplished on the cross was real. That 144,000 living saints will be able to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. And they will demonstrate the same character that Christ manifested when he went to the cross. The same words will come from their lips. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But in that is a cry out to God because they have see in themselves no good thing. Now, there is a false justification by faith where people see themselves as righteous. They see themselves as good. They see themselves as better than others. This is really just self-justification. And, and this type of justification comes usually from some kind of knowledge or special truth or message that we have that makes us think we're better than other people. So somebody can believe in the 2520, for instance, and think because they believe in the 2520 and its truth that they're better than other people who don't. And there's all kinds of things. Almost anything that you can believe in, you can set it up as something that makes you better than someone else. But with every bit of knowledge that God has given us, every bit of light, 
comes a greater responsibility. And if we are receiving light, that light will show us that we are less than we imagine. It's going to bring conviction of sin. So when light comes to us, it should do tr the work of true justification. <clears throat> but we can see here that at the end of the world, what they, the critics call um, last generation theology, this idea that there's this final generation of 144,000 people who are going to live in the sight of the holy God without a mediator, that this is the most dangerous message to Adventism. This is what pastors have told me, that this, this is what they are trying to counteract and that this is destroying Adventism. But this is Adventism. It's destroying the type of Adventism they want, but it's not destroying the gospel because the gospel cannot be destroyed. He will prepare us. We cannot prepare ourselves. We tried a long while to justify ourselves, to make ourselves just right, and thus get ready for the coming of the Lord. We have tried to do so, so well that we could approve ourselves and be satisfied and say, now I can meet the Lord, but we never were satisfied. No, it is not done that way. Whom he justified, them he glorified. Now, since God justifies, it is his own work. And when he is ready for us to meet the Lord, it will be all right, because it is he himself who prepares us to meet the Lord. Therefore, we trust in him. We yield to him and take his justification. And depending only on that, we shall be ready to meet the Lord Jesus whenever God chooses to send him. Now, we know, of course, this comes in a three-step testing prophetic message that brings us to that. Thus he is preparing now to glorify us. Again, I say, it is a fact that we have been content to live far below the wondrous privileges that God has prepared for us. Let the precious truth raise us to where he wants us. No master workman looks at a piece of his work he is doing as it is half finished and criticizes that and begins to find fault with that. There may be faults about it, but it is not finished yet. And while he works on it to take away all the faults, still he looks at it as it is in his finished purpose, in his own original plan, in his own mind. It would be an awful thing if the wondrous master workman of all were to look at us as we are half finished and say, that is good for nothing. No, he doesn't do that. He looks at us as we are in his eternal purpose in Christ and goes on with his wondrous work. You and, may, you and I may look at it and say, I don't see how the Lord is ever going to make a Christian out of me and make me fit for heaven or anything else. And that may be so as we see it. And if he looked at us as we look at ourselves, and if he were as poor a workman as we, uh, that would be all there, would, there could be of it. We could never be of any worth. But he is not such a workman as we, and therefore he does not look at us as we see ourselves. No, he looks at us as we are in his finished purpose. Although we may appear all rough, marred, and scarred now, as we are here and in ourselves, he sees us as we are yonder in Christ. He is the workman, and as we have confidence in him, he will let, we will let him carry on the work, and as he carries it on, we will look at it as he sees it. Has he not given us an example of his workmanship? God has set before us in Christ his complete workmanship in sinful flesh. In Christ he has completed it and set it there at his right hand. Now he says to us, look at that. That is what I'm able to do with sinful flesh. Now you put your confidence in me and let me work and you will watch and see what I am going to do. You trust my work workmanship. Let me attend to the work and you trust me and I will carry on the work. It is the Lord doing it all. It is not our task at all. Now, of course, people can take that statement. You know, God just does for me, you know, all the things and I don't have to do anything. But we know that's not what Jones is saying. But there is a part that we have to play and a part that God has to play. Our part is to allow God to do a work in us. And that's not an easy thing. That's not really passive. It's active. It's trusting actively in God. 
Now you can go outside of this tabernacle and look up at that window, referring to the window at the back of the pulpit. And it looks like only a mess of melted glass thrown together, black and unsightly. But come inside and look from within and you will see it as a beautiful piece of workmanship and written there in clear texts, justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The law of God written out in full and the words, here are they that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus. <clears throat> Likewise, you and I can look at ourselves as we too often do from the outside and all looks are awry, dark and ungainly, and appears as though it were only a tangled mass. And God looks at it from the inside, as it is in Jesus. And when we are in Jesus and look through the light that God has given us, when we look from the inside as we are in Jesus Christ, we shall also see, written in clear texts by the Spirit of God, justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We shall see the whole law of God written in the heart and shining in the life and the words. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. All this we shall see in the light of God as that light is reflected and shines in Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to know that this is certainly so. Way back in the bulletin, bottom of page 182, we have this sentence. I would that every soul who sees the evidences of the truth. Do you see them, brethren? Are they not evidences enough here to save us? I would that every soul who sees the evidences of the truth would accept Jesus Christ as his personal savior. Do you take him now as your personal savior in the fullness in which he has revealed himself where he is and ourselves in him where he is? Do you? Then read this. Those who thus accept Christ are looked upon by God not as they are in Adam, but as they are in Jesus Christ, as the sons and daughters of God. He looks at us as we are in Christ, for in him he has perfected his plan concerning us. Are we glad of it? Let us take it in, brethren. Oh, it does my soul good today, but good day by day as the Lord opens up these things. It is just as good to me as I long for it to be to you. So let us receive in it, receive it in the fullness of that self-abandoned faith that Jesus Christ has brought us to. Let us take it and thank God for it day by day. Let the power of it work in us, raise us from the dead, and set us at God's right hand in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ where he sits. Why should we not have a praise meeting for what God has done for us? It is the Sabbath. Could we not enjoy it? What do you want to say? <clears throat> okay, let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we yield our lives to you. We ask that we can trust in what you have done in Christ, in spite of what we see in ourselves. And that as you reveal light to us, and we see our sin, that we will confess these things and forsake them by thy power. Help us, Lord, to recognize your purpose and to trust in that purpose. We know, Lord, that um, we have often tried to justify ourselves in various different ways, all kinds of strategies. But we know, Lord, that you have justified us in Christ and that you have a purpose for us an eternal purpose. Help us to trust in that. Be with us this Sabbath. We pray for your blessing and your healing in the lives of those around us. We pray, Lord, that we can be an influence for good and not for evil. Help us to speak your words to reveal your character. And uh, we pray for the study tomorrow morning. Um, that we can wake early, that we can receive the message that you have for us. We give our hearts to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.